And I call on Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you. Uh, let's never forget that on the 23rd of June 2016, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the European Union. Every unpalatable consequence that arises from Brexit does so, therefore, as a result of the UK government defying and denying that democratic decision. And leaving the EU just 100 days from tomorrow with no deal in place would be the worst such consequence imaginable. Presiding officer, a no-deal exit from the EU would have very severe impacts on Scotland and re would result in irreparable damage to our economy, our people and our society. We know that and are compelled to say so. Our neighbours, like Ireland, know that and have been saying so for a long time. Now the entire EU27 knows that and will be saying so tomorrow. Uh, even the UK government knows it to be true as it's acknowledged at its cabinet meeting today. So what a tragedy it is, what a scandal. The members of the Parliament here on the Tory benches will still not condemn their reckless colleagues who are carelessly or willingly taking their fellow citizens to the brink of disaster. And they will neither join the rest of us in finding a sensible way to honour Scotland's choice and avoid a no-deal Brexit, nor work with us to urge the Prime Minister to rule out a no-deal Brexit by revoking or at least suspending Article 50. Scotland deserves better and needs better from the Prime Minister's blindfold EU exit or a no deal, both of which would cause untold chaos. Last week I made it clear in this chamber that the Scottish Government believes it's time to put the choice about our future back to the people in a second referendum. That is more urgent than ever now. It's essential that the UK Parliament takes control of the process, demonstrates there's a majority for a people's vote and starts work on the legislation which will deliver another referendum. However, this Scottish Government, as a responsible government, must also prepare the nation and the people in so far as it can for any eventuality, including that of a no deal. But let me say at the outset that whilst this government will do everything we can to prepare and help, we must not let anyone believe we can do everything. That would be impossible for any government anywhere. We will, however, work with all those who have a similar task, including the UK government, and tomorrow I will be meeting UK ministers to further discuss these matters. Presiding officer, let me uh, outline the Scottish government's overall approach. Over the past few months, I've met with each of my cabinet colleagues to discuss their expectations and concerns about a no-deal scenario. That process was underpinned by detailed work across government to identify the risks and potential impacts of EU exit and the mitigating actions that we and others could take across a wide range of issues. Through those processes, we have considered in detail the legislative, organisational and financial issues arising out of a possible no deal. Furthermore, weekly meetings of SCORE, the Scottish Government's Resilience Committee, have been held with the Deputy First Minister convening. These meetings have input from other Cabinet Secretaries, including those responsible for health, justice, transport, rural and finance, as well as their officials, other organisations such as Transport Scotland, Food Standards Scotland, Marine Scotland, COSLA, Civil Contingencies Responders and, of course, Police Scotland. This structure is supported by a rapid response group of officials which will grow as need requires. The issue of staffing is a key one. Across the Scottish Government, directorates are refocusing on detailed preparations for a no deal, realigning staff towards this work where required. We're mobilising the Scottish Government and its associated agencies and public bodies and aligning our existing financial and staff resources towards those areas with specific no deal impacts and ensuring that we have the right people in the right places with the right skills to respond quickly and effectively. Given the wide range of problems a no-deal exit would undoubtedly bring, ministers will understand, members will understand that our plans and preparations are wide-ranging too. Within that, there are a number of key areas of focus. It is well recognised, for example, that the new customs arrangements and regulatory checks, which a no-deal would involve, would severely disrupt the flow of goods at UK borders, particularly Dover, which handles many of our key goods, such as food and medicines. A no-deal exit would also jeopardise Scotland's food security, as well as seriously harming the ability of Scottish food and drink producers to export their goods to the EU, such as our beef and lamb, which would face significant tariffs. Half of all the food the UK consumes is imported. And of the food imported, around 70% comes from the EU. It is expected that the availability and the price of food and drink are likely to be significantly affected, with a disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable in our society. Consequently, the Scottish Government, including Transport Scotland, is working with distributors, with purchasers, with suppliers, with transport providers, with the ports and with CMAL 
to fully assess the impact and identify what can be done to help mitigate disruption. It's our aim to try and secure the best flow of essential goods into Scotland using existing routes or developing new ones. In health and social care, a no deal will put at risk the supply of medicines and medical devices. It will have a negative impact on our health and social care workforce, ongoing clinical trials, access to future EU funding, and the rights of Scottish citizens to access state-provided health care across the EU. Our attempts to ensure continuing supplies of medicines are being severely hampered by the refusal of the UK government to provide us with critical information about which medicines may be subject to supply problems. It is imperative that they provide this information now. Just two hours ago, the UK government, after sustained pressure from this government, have indicated they would share medicines data, but we still await the information. In addition, work on stockpiling of medical devices and clinical consumables in Scotland is ongoing and will have financial implications for us, which could necessitate bringing forward funding from next year. If there was a no-deal exit, we would lose access to many of the security and law enforcement cooperation measures that Police Scotland and the Crown Office use on a daily basis to keep people safe. We would lose membership of Europol and use of the European arrest warrant. We would also lose access to vital information sharing arrangements. This would represent a significant downgrading of our policing and security capability at a time when cross-border crime and security threats are increasing. Police Scotland are considering what actions could be taken to substitute for these arrangements and are organising to be prepared for civil contingencies emergencies. Finally, let me turn to fishing. Members will know that unlike the UK as a whole, Scotland is a net exporter of seafood, with EU member states accounting for 77% of Scottish overseas seafood exports in 2017. Any delays experienced at the vital Dover-Calais Eurotunnel corridor will have a catastrophic impact on our seafood industry and in turn on our remote rural and coastal communities that rely either wholly or partly on seafood sectors. I feel that particularly keenly given my constituency interests. The economic effect of a no deal, most especially in new tariff and non-tariff barriers, and the disruption to trade with the EU would therefore be felt both severely and immediately. We are investigating actively what routes might be available to ensure that such goods get to market. Though the lack of inspection staff and the reversion of the UK to third country status may well be insuperable in the short term. So much for the UK government and those benches being concerned for the fishing communities. There are, of course, many other issues on the list of risks and issues, which is being regularly updated and work is being done on all of them. But in the time available to me, let me emphasize four overarching issues that need to be noted. First, one of the biggest difficulties facing us is the problem of getting information from the UK government. There are signs that this is improving slowly in some areas, but it's essential that the UK government sees the provision of such information and the sharing of plans along with joint working as a process which requires the close involvement of and respect for the institutions of the devolved administrations. This is a matter I will stress again in London tomorrow. Secondly, we continue to press the UK government to assess fully the financial implications of leaving the EU and have been clear that Scotland's public finances must not suffer detriment. In the event of a no deal, there would require to be an urgent transfer of funds from the UK government to allow the Scottish government to meet the obligations it would have to enter into. Some money is already being spent and the financial implications of EU exit and associated preparation activity have been raised on a number of occasions by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance with the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Thirdly, the uh, nebulous approach of the UK government to decision making on Brexit has meant it is impossible to know when these plans might need to go into effect. The Scottish Cabinet agreed this morning, building on existing planning and activity, to further accelerate work to mitigate the potential impacts of the UK leaving the EU without a deal. We're undertaking necessary preparations to enable us to operate our arrangements at very short notice. I assure this chamber I will keep it informed. I make an offer to the party leaders and Brexit spokespeople to ensure they are briefed whenever new developments, developments make a move to activating our plans more likely. Finally, presiding officer, it is vital that the people of Scotland get a clear, consistent message about the work that's being done. We're using all the normal communication channels to do so. We will step up that activity in terms of public information when and if we are required to put these plans into operation. It's essential there is a single, clear, coordinating structure to take forward the plans and to measure them against the reality of what is taking place. Under the leadership of the Deputy First Minister, that will be the SCORE mechanism, which is now in operation, and it will report to the First Minister. 
A no-deal cliff-edge exit is not yet inevitable. Indeed, leaving the EU is not yet inevitable. But as a responsible government, we cannot wait any longer. The consequences and risks are too pressing and too severe. Given the current situation, it's incumbent on us to step our, up our existing planning for a no-deal outcome in the ways I've just outlined. The evidence is clear that a no-deal would be a disaster. And again, I call on the Tories to work with us to rule it out. The challenges are not of our making, but being able to measure up to them is something that we can and must do. Thank you very much. I call on Adam Tompkins to be followed by Neil Findlay. Adam Thank Tompkins. you, Senator Officer. The Minister has just spent 10 minutes unpicking his own argument. He opposes a no-deal Brexit. So do I. He considers that all necessary steps should be taken to avoid a no-deal Brexit. So do I. But the truth, presiding officer, is that there does not need to be any risk at all of a no-deal Brexit. For the simple reason, simple enough, simple enough even for the minister to understand, that there is a deal on the table, a concluded, negotiated withdrawal agreement. A withdrawal agreement, presiding officer, which I support, but which SNP MPs are set to vote down. So why does the minister not accept that the only people risking a no-deal Brexit are those who stand like him in opposition to the Prime Minister's deal. Cabinet Secretary. It is sad, I think, to see the state to which Professor Tomkins has come. This is a very serious situation. It needs to be treated with gravity. It is a situation not of the making of this chamber, of the people of Scotland, of any of the parties here, except Professor Tomkins' own party, which has made this problem. And yet, the only response to it that we can get from the Tories is to get up and to blame somebody else. <laughs> let me, let me... That's right. I hope that, I do hope, I do hope, I do hope that those, those who are listening to this elsewhere will realise that the response to this very grave and serious situation from the front bench of the Tories is to cack... Uh, cackle, like, uh, to quote the Bible, thorns under an empty pot, so is the laughter of fools. That is a quote, incidentally, presiding officer, in case you were going to upbraid me for it. The UK Cabinet, can I say to Professor Tomkins, the UK Cabinet spent this entire morning talking about a no-deal outcome. It is now sending letters to 146,000 businesses. I understand that uh, the, the Brexit secretary was uh, uh, talking today about the disaster that could take place. But that doesn't matter because all that Professor Tompkins, who is still shouting, Professor Tompkins is still shouting into this chamber, into the air, because it's always to do with something other than the Tories. It is, presiding officer, the Tories that have brought us to this mess. It is clearly the Tories can't get us out of it. Neil Findlay to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, thanks, President Officer. It's always, uh, it's always telling to observe the uh, Mr. Tompkins' body language on these occasions, because I know Les Mis is coming on TV over the holidays, but you only need to look at the front bench to see the miserables as they are. Mr. Tompkins did not believe a single word that he says, and he hasn't believed a single word all the way through this sham. The Tories are taking Britain to the brink in a game of chance that risks everything to try and save this incompetent and useless government. Uh, they have created in two years huge uncertainty for our economy, for businesses and their employees. Labour has consistently warned against the no-deal outcome, and now it's clear that Tory incompetence is pushing us towards it. <coughs> Excuse me. If Tory MPs act in the interests of the country, not in the interests of the Conservative Party, and work to end this madness, then Labour stands ready to negotiate with a customs union plan that solves the backstop issue. The main, though far from being the only problem. Uh, this statement shows us that there are huge problems in major areas of the economy and our society, at our borders, in food security, in transport, in health and social care, medicine supplies, policing and law enforcement, and fishing and exporting, and of course, much, much, much more. And with all that catastrophe taking us to the edge, what a dereliction of duty it is for Scottish Tory MPs and MSPs to sit there and take a vow of silence. Mr. Finlay, Mr. Finlay, could you ask a question of the Cabinet Secretary, please? I am going to ask a question. 
Their party's hatred of the EU clearly outstrips their concern for business, employees and communities. There is, however, still time to change. This cannot be a choice between May's deal or no deal. That's no choice whatsoever. So will the Cabinet Secretary now publish details of the work being done in each directorate? Can he advise how many times and how many ministers have met with their UK counterparts to specifically discuss no deal planning? And can he advise what budget has been allocated and staffing resource identify, identified to prefer, prepare for such a scenario? The Scottish Government is right to plan for no deal, indeed it must, but we need further detail. Right. Thank you. I thank the member for his questions, and I certainly concur with him that the position of the Scottish Tories on this is, is, is absolutely appalling. Uh, it is a dereliction of duty, and they continue to behave in a way that no person could take them seriously. If I can just address his points, I'm, I'm reluctant to, 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 to burden the staff with even more publications, but I am happy to give him access to any information I possibly can, and I'll sit down and talk to him about, uh, about that and how we can do so. On the second point of communication, um, I'm happy to, to discover how many communications have been, but I know, for example, that Michael Matheson was in touch with his uh, counterpart just last week, uh, pressing for more information, and I think that many of my colleagues would do so, and I'll try and get him that information. I think it's important to recognise that we are in a situation which is fast moving and which is creating a great deal of pressure for staff in terms of the actual costs and staff moving. I noticed figures were published last week, and I'll get them uh, to the member if he hasn't yet seen them on the staffing full-time equivalents that are engaged in this now. There is a difficulty in accessing fully what money is being spent simply because it is so fast moving, but we will make sure that information is provided. Ross Greer to be followed by Willie Reddy. Thank you. I accept absolutely what the Cabinet Secretary said, that not only have we been taken to the brink of disaster, we've been taken to the brink of disaster by the most incompetent government in modern history. This is absolutely not something of the Scottish Government's doing, but sometimes we all must play with the hand that we're dealt, especially governments. Given that, and given the Cabinet Secretary's response to Neil Finlay, could I ask, in comparison to the 105 technical notices that the UK Government has put into the public domain, what information will the Scottish Government put into the public domain as opposed to that which they will brief MSPs on? Cabinet Secretary. Each, uh, each part of Scottish Government is dealing directly with stakeholders on these issues. And that is one of the benefits of having a smaller government. We are able to do so. So there is a great deal of dialogue going on. I know all the members would like more material actually published and put in front of them. I'm trying to do the best we can with the resources we have to keep people updated, but also where there are requests, as Mr Finley has made a request, and clearly that's been echoed by Mr Greer, for some further information, I will endeavour to get some further information sent from officials. But the, the situation we're trying to cope with here is to move step by step to the stage where if uh, it, it, we had to put our plans into operation, we would be able to do so virtually immediately. And that is my main focus. Uh, and I, I'm sure members will accept it is best that that is my main focus rather than being distracted from it at this stage. Willie Rennie to be followed by John McAlpine. Uh, I can't believe that uh, we're having these discussions of this nature. No responsible government would ever allow this to happen. But that this is real shows how irresponsible the Conservative government has become. Is he as frustrated as I am about the inability of the UK government and the loyal opposition or its inability to lead this country or lead the Parliament? If the Parliament can't decide the future on Brexit, surely it's up to the people. How can we make that people's vote happen? I, I agree with Mr Rennie um, that that is the key issue now, how the people can be given the opportunity to give their verdict, not on uh, what happened two and a half years ago, but on the verdict of what has happened over these past two and a half years and the situation that we're now in, and to make an informed choice. Now, I do believe that when put to the test in the House of Commons, there could be a majority for a people's vote. I think there is an enormous danger, whether actively or passively allowing this matter to continue to run on into the third week of uh, January, where the potential for being able to take corrective action diminishes day by day. So I'm happy to work with a member and to work with anybody to find a way to forcing that issue. And, and I would hope right across uh, the opposition parties that there might be some change of heart in that and that people would say, we need to get that done. I, I cannot, I think there are three possibilities probably left on the table now 
Uh, one is the no deal, and it's absolutely wise that we prepare for that, though it is a nightmarish prospect, and I've spent a great deal of time on this in, in the last several months, and I have to say I, I don't sleep easy at night when I, I consider it. Uh, the second one is the Theresa May deal, which is an appalling deal, very, very damaging to Scotland, particularly in terms of freedom of movement, and indeed one sees today some indication of the UK government that their uh, white paper, which has been delayed for 18 months on migration when it comes out, will be even worse, and that is very frightening indeed, or the people's vote. It is the people's vote that all sensible people should settle on, and we should get on and do it. June McAlpine to be followed by Murder Fraser. Thank you. The Scottish Council Development and Industry told this Parliament's Europe Committee that a no deal will create substantial delays for imports and exports to airports and ports, with perishable food and drink particularly at risk. The Scottish pharmaceutical, chemical and related products will no longer be accredited for sale in the EU and the attractiveness of Scotland as a leading destination for inward investment will be severely damaged and the supply of workers will decrease in an already tight labour market which will cause prices to rise for consumers. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me and the SCVO that no amount of mitigation can prevent such calamitous consequences of a no-deal Brexit? I do agree it's very difficult to, to, and I've made that absolutely clear, it's not only difficult, it's impossible to, to mitigate all the effects of this. The member raises one particular sector that is of, of enormous importance in Scotland, which is the pharmaceutical sector. Um, of course, leaving the European Medicines Agency has meant that the agency has moved to Amsterdam. That is bad enough. In the event of no deal, there would be no arrangement in place. This was a key issue, members may remember, during the, uh, the referendum. And Michael Gove, in particular, uh, st uh, stampeded around the country telling people that uh, having our own medicines agency would accelerate the uh, uh, production of new drugs. That was utterly untrue. Because what actually has happened is, first of all, uh, drugs cannot be tested for the EMA outside the EU. So that means that we've lost jobs and we've lost potential jobs and we've lost part of an industry. But in addition to that, the UK becomes a small part of the global um, uh, pharmaceutical market, about 3%, as a result of which then there will be work done to satisfy the EU regulations and the U USA regulations before the UK is even touched. So what was a, a promise, an assertion, turns out to be completely hollow, and it is costing all of us dear. Murder Fraser to be followed by Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. If there were to be a second referendum on the EU, would the Scottish Government accept the result? Cabinet Secretary. It's very, it is, very it is still question. not possible for Murdo Fraser to rise to the occasion. We're here, we're here looking at the serious consequences of a no deal. But Murdo Fraser thinks he's in some school debating contest. He wouldn't, he wouldn't actually win a school debating contest, but he's in some sort of school debating contest. And he thinks by a clever question, it's not a particularly clever question, but by a clever question, he can deflect in some way, presiding officer, the attention, not just of this parliament, but the attention of the Scottish people on the massive dereliction of duty that the Scottish Tories are guilty of, of the massive betrayal of the people of Scotland, that we have come to this position, is a result of that type of childish, pathetic behaviour. Murdo, Murdo Fraser does not deserve to be treated as a serious politician. Fortunately, Scotland knows he isn't. Annabel Ewing to be followed by James Kelly. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary spoke about the need for the UK Government to take the option of no deal off the table. Does he have any confidence that this message is actually getting through to the Prime Minister and her Cabinet colleagues? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we may have the opportunity to assess that tomorrow uh, when there's a JMC meeting, but I, I, have to, I have to say that this Prime Minister has shown herself incapable of, of listening to anybody but herself. Uh, it's quite extraordinary, actually. There was a, a piece, I think, written by... Ryan Heath of Politico at the weekend, which point, pointed out a number of uh, mistakes that the Prime Minister had made since the 2016 uh, vote. Uh, and the first of those was uh, anybody, any politician worth their salt, would, realising that there were a number of competed, competing interests, including uh, Scotland had voted against, Northern Ireland had voted against, uh, would have got the key players in the room and sat them down and said, look, how can we work together to find a way through this? How can we construct uh, something that all of us will get something out of. There's not been any sign of that at all. Uh, quite the reverse. Brexit means Brexit. She started off saying, and she's still saying it. 
So I, I don't think I have any confidence that uh, she is listening. But we will go on talking because it's absolutely essential that we speak up for the people of Scotland. James Kelly to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When Derek Mackay published the government's draft budget last week, he indicated that it would have to be revisited in the circumstances of a no-deal Brexit. Given that budget contains £319 million of cuts to local councils, does the government's assessment of a no-deal Brexit mean further cuts to local councils, which will have dire consequences to local communities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we're working through the SCORE mechanism, as I indicated, in partnership with COSLA, who are a member, uh, and we've invited into the SCORE mechanism to take part in this, in, in a way that means that we will come to a common mind about what requires to be done. I'm not going to enter in, into a debate about local authority figures, simply to say that uh, I noticed this morning that uh, uh, in the figures issued that Argyll and Butte had a, an increase of £9 million, which was very welcome, speaking as a member for Argyll and Butte. But I do think it's important that COSLA's input to this is listened to, and it will be listened to. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Jamie Green. Presiding officer, the Cabinet Secretary touched on communications or lack thereof received from the UK government. What detail has he or ministerial colleagues had regarding funding for Brexit planning, not least the recently announced two billion for a no-deal Brexit? And has any information been provided as to how much Scotland is set to receive from this? Cabinet Secretary. I thank, I thank the member for that question. I, I noticed uh, at lunchtime today that the uh, the Chancellor was apparently upbraiding his colleagues for not having spent the uh, £1.5 billion pounds he had already allocated to Brexit No Deal planning. I mean, we have not had anything like a proportionate share of that money. Um, we continue to argue the case for the sums that we require to have. We are expending money, and I've indicated in my statement that that process has already started. So the, Derek Mackay is uh, making representations to the Chancellor and to the uh, Chief Secretary, and will continue to do so. But it is vitally important they recognise that we will require uh, what we will require in essentially to do this job. I will go on trying to get it. Jamie Green to be followed by Stuart McWillan. Uh, presenting officer, let us never forget that on the 18th of September 2014, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the United Kingdom, something that this government seems to have forgotten throughout this complete narrative. But given, given that the EU has very publicly stated, if I may, given that the EU has very publicly stated that substantive changes to the deal already agreed between the EU uh, 27 and the UK uh, are simply not on the table. And so says Mr. Tusk, Mr. Juncker, Varadkar, Macron, and so on. W and what evidence does the minister base his view that anyone else will get a different or better deal? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not going to even comment on the first point, which is, is utterly ridiculous and shows Tories yet again unable to front bench, unable to rise to occasion. But the answer to the second point is very simple indeed. Uh, it has been made crystal clear during this entire process that what you get out is a product of what you put in. And if you put in a series of impossible red lines, uh, the, the members do not wish to listen to this, but I'm going to say it because it's really important and it's factually based. What happens is if you set a series of red lines, then you get the outcomes of those red lines. And I would draw the member's attention, I'm surprised he hasn't seen it, but I draw the member's attention to a slide produced by the Barnier Task Force, which has been reproduced twice in Scottish government publications, that illustrates that by going through the various types of relationships with the EU, going through the EEA relationship, going through the relationship of a trade treaty, going through the Ukraine Association, uh, and indicating that the, and it's like a, a step, it indicates that the red lines produce the outcome. If the red lines change, if the inputs change, then the outcome changes. For example, the present red lines include ending freedom of movement, apparently proudly ending it. I, I do not understand for the life of me how anybody can say they are proud of that. That is a Tory position. But ending freedom of movement. If that is a red line, you cannot be in the EEA because the EEA arrangement includes the four freedoms. So that is a red line that produces an outcome. If you remove that red line, then you get a different outcome. That is simple. It is, in actual fact, uh, EU Negotiations 101. I'm surprised that Jamie Green hasn't read it and hasn't seen the chart. I'm not. Stuart McWillan to be followed by Rudy Grant. Thank you. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary spoke about the No Deal cliff edge, which the Tories seem to think actually was quite humorous. But of the options that are there, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that, uh, that there is an option on the table for the UK Government not to be constrained 
by its own red lines, and that the arbitrary date for leaving the EU, which is to seek an extension to Article 50. Cabinet Secretary. It is absolutely clear, as a result, I say thanks to, uh, to, 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 to Mr. Greer and his colleagues yet again, it's absolutely clear that Article 50 now can be revoked by the UK, um, or an application could be made for Article 50 to be uh, extended. That's absolutely clear, and that's the right thing to do. That's a sensible thing to do now. Um, I think it's fairly clear that Article 50 would be extended if the reason for that was either to hold a general election or to have a people's vote. I think that would take place. So that's there and on the table. And indeed, given the verdict uh, in, in, of the European Court, it would be possible for them to revoke Article 50, to have that, and, and then to resubmit Article 50. That's actually what the judgment says, the Article 50 letter. Uh, I hope they do a bit of work on it first. They didn't do any work on the first version. So in these circumstances, it is perfectly possible to say, let us stop this now. And then what we would then do is, of course, revert to existing terms which would be something, I think, that would be tremendously welcomed throughout the country. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Rhoda Mackay. Can I ask which ports and routes the Scottish Government are looking at as alternatives to Dover? What boats they're hoping to procure given they can't find boats to fulfil their own routes and services? And will he publish the Government's impact assessments so our agriculture and fishing industries can prepare? Cabinet Well. Grangemouth and Recite are clearly the obvious two ports and Transport Scotland is looking closely at those to uh, assess whether there is additional capacity. Uh, I think the member's assessment of ferries is not accurate of vessels. Uh, it may not be possible to source a, uh, an alternative ferry for the Western Isles, so even I have, have questioned that. Uh, this is an entirely different type of uh, vessel that you would require, a much commoner type of vessel uh, that is available, and that will certainly uh, be looked at. Um, I think uh, you know, a great deal of work is being done. I I'm not going to start publishing a great deal of material because it's far important that the work is done, but I have made it clear that I'm absolutely open to answering questions, to giving information, to doing what we can to make sure people understand what's taking place. But I think publishing more material at this stage on, on this would not be helpful to anybody. Rona Mackay to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Presiding officer, given that Scotland voted to remain in the EU but has been dragged out against our democratic wishes, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the resources the Scottish Government is investing would be better spent preparing Scotland for the future, not mitigating the damage which will be inflicted by a hard Tory Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. I think the great, one of the many great tragedies in this appalling situation is the time and effort and resource that's being absorbed into the whole Brexit process. Uh, no deal planning takes a great deal of that. Uh, and I've spent a, a lot of my time and a lot of officials' time and a lot of ministers' time uh, on that and will continue to do so. But the whole thing is like a, a black hole that is sucking in energy and resource uh, at a time when it could be far better expended elsewhere. And that will be the judgment of history upon the Conservatives, that uh, they frittered away so much on something that was so pointless. Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Everywhere you turn in Westminster, it is gripped by inertia. Whether that is in the inertia of Theresa May in postponing the meaningful vote, or in Her Majesty's opposition in refusing to use the supremacy of Parliament through a vote of no confidence in the government. While we defer this decision, uh, uncertainty reigns, planning for a no-deal Brexit has to happen because until we have that meaningful vote, we cannot begin to game out the other scenarios, including a people's vote. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we must force the government to have the meaningful vote before Christmas, even if that means cancelling Christmas for our Westminster colleagues? Well, it's Cabinet not, Secretary. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the member would not encourage me to, to play Scrooge. Um, that would be very unlike me, I have to say. Uh, I'm certainly not going to do that. But I do think it would be far, far better to have the meaningful vote this week uh, or possibly even on Monday on Christmas Eve. Uh, it would be far, far better to get to the stage that we were able uh, to bring the issue of a people's vote to the House of Commons as early as possible in the new year. So I agree with them on that and I agree with them on something else I have to say. I'm really heartened to discover that Alec Cole Hamilton now shares my own dis despair and disdain at Westminster. A welcome to the Nationalist Club. And that concludes our statement on preparations for any... Oh, point of order, Mike Rumbles. I helpfully uh, responded to two members saying that he will give information to those two members about how much the government has spent on preparations for a no deal and what proportion of that is coming from the, from the UK government. Would it not be more appropriate for the minister to lay that for all MSPs to see through SPICE? 
I'm Yes, I'm sure, I'm sure the Minister uh, noted the Member's comments and uh, I'm sure actually the Minister was intending to publish, not just a, a single that the two Members responded to, but the Member's comments have been noted, although it is not a point of order. And we'll move on to a statement from Hamza Youssef on uh, conduct reviews and inquiries. We'll just take a few moments for the Minister and Members to change seats.